been said. Um, my Lord, I'll, I'll go straight to the points. One, what is on trial or what is at stake in, a, in the setup of an interim in, uh, conservatory order? My Lord, I'd like to uh, inform the court that what is on trial is a bill of rights. Uh, and uh, Article 38 of the Constitution provides that a person has a right uh, to vie and be elected for office, and if elected, has a right to hold that office. My Lord, that is one of the things that is uh, on trial, but I will ignore that for now. Uh, what is at stake, because a conservatory order is supposed to preserve uh, the substratum, is the right to a fair trial. My Lord, the components of a fair trial include the tribunal that is independent, it includes the process and the outcome. My Lord, the, one of the, uh, and the outcome includes the remedies that are available uh, by law to the indi individuals before the court. One of the remedies, the material remedies that uh, the parties before this court are seeking is reinstatement of Deputy President uh, Rigati Gashagwa to office. Therefore, and I will demonstrate when I talk about the Waji case at the end, that once a new person assumes that office, that remedy is completely taken off the table. And that means these conservatory orders are actually at the heart of a fair trial. And a fair trial is among the rights under our constitutions that cannot be limited. It is not that a fair trial is absolutely not limitable, but that the state through its action or any person through their deliberate action cannot limit the right to a fair trial. Why do I say this? During a trial, the witnesses may die naturally. Um, COVID may happen and cases are delayed naturally. That is extrinsic and it may affect a fair trial, but the court must never do anything deliberately that would impede a fair trial or that would be uh, um, uh, uh, imputed as uh, limiting the right to a fair trial. So my Lord, by lifting this conservatory order, you will be actually limiting the rights of uh, the petitioners to a fair trial by taking away an, a very um, material remedy to the remedies that are available to them. I'd like to talk about what is the place of the Bill of Rights under our Constitution and uh, the, the concept of public interest because it has come up uh, very much. Now, our Bill of Rights under our Constitution is very fundamental. The Bill of Rights, the chapter on the Bill of Rights is the only chapter under our Constitution that has its own doctrine of interpretation. And the Bill of Rights is enjoyed individually as per Article 19, is by individuals. It is actually antithetical to the concept of human rights and individual human rights to say that the Bill of Rights will be enjoyed at the behest of a public interest. They are actually specified there expressly, especially to be enjoyed in spite of the public interest. So I, I feel like the argument that the public interest should be balanced against the Bill of Rights is antithetical to the very concept of the Bill of Rights. The limitations of the Bill of Rights is captured in Article 24, and I would have read the entire article for us to see, but what the provisions that it provides is that the Bill of Rights will not be limited except by law, and then only uh, in a manner that is reasonable and justifiable. My Lord, the public interest that has been uh, uh, propounded by uh, at least the response by the Attorney General or the application that by the Attorney General did not disclose the legal basis of that public interest. In fact, it was just general. And it brings me to the, uh, the question, it reminds me, in 1945, the Supreme Court of uh, uh, the United States was um, faced with a case about uh, uh, the Anti-Obscenities Act or Anti-Pornography Act. And uh, Justice um, Stewart, unable to define what pornography is, uh, in his concurring opinion, wrote, you will know it when you see it. My Lord, that is the kind of public interest that the Attorney General is asking us to use to balance against the Bill of Rights. A public interest that we cannot really tell what it is. Um, my Lord, uh, the public interest that should be able to limit the Bill of Rights must be founded in law. There must be a legal basis for which you're saying this is a public interest. Whatever the Attorney General has propounded, in fact, has not even specified. It must, it must not be vague. It must be very specific so that we can assess its reasonability and whether it, is, uh, it can actually be justiciable or it's justified bet uh, within a democratic society. My Lord, I saw in the response by the National Assembly, the uh, public interest has been a bit defined and has been stated as the fact that we do not have an IBC. My Lord, that is not a legal question. 
the other issue was that we cannot stay without a deputy president. My Lord, as had been propounded earlier, kindly allow me uh, two minutes. As has been propounded earlier, my Lord, uh, the Constitution allows us not to have a deputy president for at least 60 days, in fact, 74 days. So we don't yet have a legal crisis as we speak. We may have a political crisis, but it's not a legal crisis. The absence of an IBC is a political crisis, a political crisis that cannot be brought before the High Court, a court of human rights, as uh, for, for that to be balanced against human rights. My Lord, the politi uh, political arms of government are the ones best placed to deal with a political crisis. And tomorrow they can appoint an IEBC if really there's a political crisis. Uh, finally, my Lord, um, I would like uh, to uh, bring attention to three cases by the Supreme Court. The Munya case, Mata Karua case, and uh, Speaker Mate case. Uh, because they kind of explained how conservatory orders ought to be interpreted. And my Lord, what I read from those cases is that a court order through a conservatory uh, order cannot overthrow the constitutional um, values and constitutional imperatives. A conservatory order by the court um, fetters discretion, constitutional or statutory discre discretion, never constitutional obligation. And so, my Lord, in the context of this conservatory order, the conservatory order uh, cannot be interpreted in a manner as to um, freeze time. Because the, 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 uh, one of the things that is considered by all parties in this case is that an impeachment did happen. And it's presumed to have happened lawfully until this court finds that it did not happen lawfully. Uh, by that, the Constitution is very express that uh, the office will fall vacant. And so that one, however much a court attempts, it cannot uh, constrain an edict of the, an imperative of the Constitution. So the office is vacant as we speak. However, time started running, and the president had 14 days, a discretion of 14 days. The court order can fetter that discretion, and where it seems to the court that uh, the, the discretion was abused and rushed in order so that you can avoid the rule of law and whatnot, the court can make the conservatory order to be deemed as if the action was done, at, as if that abuse was not there. So that the president still had the 14 days, and so the time is counting. Parliament will still have 60 days. Now, at the end of the 74th day, this court's conservatory order, however much it tries, it cannot extend beyond that. Finally, my lord, I want to talk about the Wajir case because nobody has talked about it and uh, it was part of the Attorney General's application uh, and response. The Wajir case relates to a, a governor who was impeached. Uh, the deputy governor assumed office and then even nominated a new deputy governor and then later on the, the, court, the high court found the impeachment to have been unlawful and reinstated the governor back to office. My lord, uh, there is a distinction uh, both a constitutional distinction and even a procedural distinction in the two cases. In the Wajia case, the court had issued a conservatory order against the assumption of office, which was defied. But aside from that, because that still is arguable as to whether a conservatory order can do that, there is the question of uh, part of the rule of law and a fair trial is the enforcement, the enforceability of a court order. Now, a court order may be enforced against the deputy governor or the governor of a county. But as per our constitution and as per the holding of BBI in, uh, in the BBI case, the presidency is absolutely immune. No amount of court order will be issued that will be able to be enforced against it. Because who will enforce uh, the court order declaring the office of president vacant? My Lord, it's the political arms of government that can deal with that. And that might be one of the issues that are uh, political questions that the court cannot really address. So, my lord, uh, as far as the office of the deputy president is concerned, such an order cannot come from this court. We cannot allow the, uh, the conservatory order to be lifted, and then we imagine that we will be able to enforce an order uh, uh, removing uh, Dr. Professor Kindiki from office. My lord, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask my co petitioner, uh, I think petitioner number 12. <laughs> And Article 57 of the Constitution. All the new battle of the fire.